so this is the first novel I've, I've written which is set in Ireland, uh, which is obviously the country that I'm from. Um, and it's a subject matter which I think most Irish novelists have um, uh, avoided over the last uh, 20 years or so for some reason, even though it's been the, the key topic, I think, in our political discourse and social discourse um, over, the, over that time. Um, when I started thinking about the book, one of the things I wanted to do was, uh, uh, because I had felt this great anger towards the church for many, many years since my own childhood, um, I felt that uh, if I wrote just a diatribe, it wasn't going to be very interesting. It was just going to be a boring, um, obvious book. So I, I thought what I would try to do is think of a narrator who uh, had, has tried to live a good life, has, has tried to do the right thing, uh, and has got to an advanced age and realises that the institution to which he has given his life and his time um, has betrayed him as much as anybody else. Um, it started out like that, of course, the narrator becomes a little unreliable uh, eventually because one of the main themes of the book and of this whole story is the complicity of those priests who did not commit criminal acts but who were aware of things that were going on and uh, did nothing about it, didn't say anything, didn't do anything. So I'm just going to read a, a, a short section that takes place in the, the, the novel moves back and forth through time uh, from the 50s or 60s to today. Uh, and each chapter goes a different part of the narrator's life. And um, this part, though, takes place in 2012, after all the court cases have begun, and after uh, the, the country has really changed and the authority of the church has gone, and all those victims are, are speaking out for the first time. So this takes place when um, the narrator, Father Odin Yates, goes to the four courts in Dublin to hear a, um, to witness a trial. And he goes into the trial, he can only stay a few minutes because he's um, it's, too, uh, it's too upsetting for him. So he goes outside and he sits in, in the round hall and this is what happens. Despite the number of people lingering under the circular dome, making their way in and out of the other three courtrooms where different cases were being heard, I felt that I could breathe out here and was not yet ready to make my way through the reporters and photographers still gathered on Inns Quay. I made my way to one of the benches at the side, sat down next to a woman on her own, and bent over a little, my head in my hands. What kind of life was this, I wondered? To what sort of an organisation had I dedicated my life? And even as I searched for blame, I knew that a darkness was stirring inside me concerning my own complicity, for I had seen things, and I had suspected things, and I had turned away from things, and I had done nothing. A hand touched my arm, and I almost jumped off the seat in fright, but it was just the woman seated next to me. She had a tired expression and not a hint of a smile on her face. I thought she was going to say something like, are you all right, father? But instead she just stared at me. I knew I recognized her from somewhere, but I could not say where. You're father Yates, aren't you? She asked me finally, her voice low and quiet. That's right, I said, do I know you? You do, she said, do you not remember me? I shook my head. I do and I don't, I said, you look familiar, but I can't place you. Kathleen Kilduff, she said, and I closed my eyes. Mrs. Kilduff, I said meekly. We met in Wexford in 1990. You were down visiting your pal. I was the fool who was delivering her son into his hands every week for an hour. Of course, I said, I remember you now. And you remember Brian too, don't you? I do, I said, I remember Brian. Did you feel good about yourself reporting him like you did? You know the guard he scared him half to death when they interviewed him about the damage he'd done to that monster's car. I'm sorry, I said. I didn't know what to do at the time. I thought maybe there was something wrong with the boy. I thought that if Tom knew, maybe he could help him. Oh, he helped him all right, she said, laughing bitterly. So didn't he go to the guardie and tell them that if they just cautioned the boy, he'd see to it that he never did anything like that again. And then he persuaded me to send Brian in to him Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays three days a week for an hour every time. And of course I did what I was told. Brian, she added, my little lad, who never did a bit of harm to anyone in his life. He wanted to be a vet, did you know that? He had a little dog that he just adored. I stared down at the floor. When I told that story earlier, when I told you about 1990, that I mentioned that I took what I had seen and reported it to Tom the next morning, and he called the guardian, and that I had told them what I had seen, identifying the boy in his own house later that same day. Perhaps I didn't. If I didn't, I should have. 
Anyway, here it is, out in the open now. Mrs. Kilduff, I said, uncertain what I was going to say next, but she interrupted me. Don't say my name, she said, and get off this bench right now. I don't want you sitting anywhere near me. I nodded and stood up, turning to walk away, but before I could, I thought I should at least say something to try to atone for what I had done. I hope Brian is doing all right, I said. I hope he's found a way to cope with whatever happened to him. She stared at me as if I was deliberately insulting her. Are you trying to hurt me? She asked. Is that what you're doing? Are you deliberately trying to be cruel? No, I said quickly, failing to understand. I only meant, sure, Brian is dead these last 15 years, she said. He hanged himself in his bedroom. I went up one day after school to fetch him down for his dinner, and there he was, his little legs dancing in the air, the poor dog staring up at him, not knowing what to do. He killed himself. So tell me now, are you proud of yourself, father? You and your pal in there. Are you proud of yourselves, of all the things you and your pals have done? Do you even care? Okay, so I'll do it. So I don't know if you'd like to ask me anything. If you would, um, I'd be happy to answer. Uh, what's, what's it like now? For the church and the priest who active? In, in Ireland now? Yeah. Um, it, it's very different because for years, you know, at, at its height, there was about 17, 1800 uh, vocations every year. And we used to send um, a lot of our priests off to what we call the missions, you know, Africa and South America. And now there's about three vocations every year. So Ireland has become the missions and priests come from other countries to Ireland. And it's very hard, naturally enough, it's very hard to get young people to go into the church because why would they? They're, they're being cut off from so many of the you know, important aspects of life. Um, you know, the very drives that, that are, are a big part of our, our, ourselves as, as human beings. Um, and because of all the, the scandals in the church and the way, particularly the way the church has failed to address that, um, they haven't made any, they haven't atoned for what they've done. They haven't paid a lot of the, the, uh, the money they're supposed to pay to victims. Um, they still make victims feel like um, they're in some way culpable for what they did. So th there's still a, there's a great deal of resentment towards the church, but the problem is they still, um, they still run the education system, really. They run a lot of the schools. And you can't get into, your kid can't get into the school unless the kid is baptized. And so many people just have to send their children there. So they still have some type of hold over things, but young people growing up have, have zero interest. And they have nobody to blame for that but themselves, really. You know, one, one thing I really wanted to ask you is I read that really nice piece you wrote in The Guardian, um, I guess right as the, as the book was released, and um, you talked about how you um, really wanted to try to paint a full picture of the priest. You didn't want to just create monsters, obviously. And you went and you, you interviewed some priests for it. Was that, is that right? Yes. So how was that for you in that... Um, how was that for you? So I can imagine that that was probably the first long conversation you had with the priest since you probably left it and but also from a position of I don't want to say authority but you're now kind of a celebrated author and so you're not in the position you had been towards and your relationship had probably changed significantly. What was that like? Um, it was um, it was quite sad at times and I had quite conflicted feelings towards it because a lot of priests would feel priests in their sixties or seventies who have committed no criminal acts would um, would tell me how difficult it is to be tarred with the same brush as those who did. And the, the result of that on their lives in terms of, you know, they won't go into town wearing their clerical garb in case people attack them or something, um, the names they're called on a daily basis. And you feel, on one hand, you feel sorry for them for that. But on the other hand, um, this question of complicity is so important that it's very difficult to imagine that these priests in their younger days did not know what was going on. Priests would be moved from parish to parish to parish at with ridiculous speed every time a priest was reported to the bishop for uh, abusing a child rather than going to the police. They would simply move them to a different diocese. So it's all, on one hand, you know, yeah, you'd feel a sympathy for them, but on the other hand, you think, well, why didn't you speak out when, when you could have? Why did you not feel that you should? Why didn't you go to the police? And their, their answer to that is generally, well, look, you know, I was too low down the ladder. Um, I reported it to the powers that be because they delude themselves that the powers that be are the powers that be of the church. But the powers that be are the powers that be of the law. 
you know, and, and they forget that, and they would look for sympathy for that. So I, I felt conflicted about it, but I, I did feel sympathy for their, um, you know, the, their loneliness, um, as the title of the book would suggest. Uh, the, a lot of them spoke about how lonely the priesthood was, and I think it's, uh, I think it's a big flaw of the Catholic Church that they, they still insist on celibacy. Not that a lot, not that all the priests <laughs> continue down that line, but. Um, it, it's always seemed ridiculous to me that uh, the notion that somebody, if they are loved and if they give love, that therefore they won't be able to do their job right. If anything, it would seem to me that you do your job better when you're when you're in that position. Um, I, I, the, the, the only real response, though, since the book was published, one priest did write a, an article in the Irish Times asking people to pray for me, um, and he didn't like it very much. <laughs> But, uh, you know, you've got to, they, they still bury their heads in the sand quite a bit, and the institution has such a history of authority that I think those older members of that community still find it impossible to understand why they're not respected the way they once were. Do they even speak about it, though, from a spiritual point of view? Because there is the, the spiritual belief that supposedly underpins that religion. There's the... Uh, no, no, they don't have any spiritual belief. You don't, you don't if you felt that they, they were not... No. No, because I mean, most of these people were going into seminaries when they were 16, 17 years of age. They weren't going in because they had a vocation. They were going in because their mothers put them there. And then they, you know, they got older and it's a job. I don't think I ever heard a priest talk about religion. Well, God, um, but just, you know, the unconditional I know it's like love it's or anything of, like it's, that. It's kind of ridiculous, but no. I don't think they have any particular interest in it. Interesting. Okay. Tell me why you wrote the book. Um, I mean, this, is, this has been... You know, so covered, you almost tea. Well, you see, it hasn't been covered in Irish fiction at all. No one's really written about it. Yeah. And, and I wrote it because, um, like with any novel I've written, I thought I could tell the story in, a, in an original way, a way that hasn't been told before, and give people insight into it. And what I, what I hoped was that I wanted to write the type of book that those people who just condemn the church constantly and refuse to accept that there are good people who have given their lives to it um, would recognize that fact that there are good people and at the same time those people who um, defend the church constantly against all comers and won't hear a word said against them will recognize what they are responsible for, the things that they have done and, um, and, and take account of that. You know, I, I, I wanted to just kind of open up, some, particularly in Ireland, to open up some kind of discussion about that fact mm. that, that it's um, it's not just black and white, really. It, it's, it, you have to think about what these priests went through as well. Their terrible childhoods, their, you know, being forced into a job that they should never have been in. Not that it justifies anything that they did. Um, and, and you also have to think about, you know, why, why they didn't um, act upon their, their knowledge. Why they were so eager to, uh, or so willing to put children in jeopardy for decades. Because that still baffles me. I still don't quite understand it. You know Mary Graf Grafton's documentary on the priest. I'm sorry? Mary Raftery, who passed away, she has a documentary on the Catholic. Oh, right, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, but novels just. Yeah, I so, you know, and that's been out know, for quite a while. Mm. Um, so, are you, are you still practicing Catholic? Oh, no, no. Okay. I'm not a Catholic at all. Practicing or not. <laughs> when did you leave the church for, for yourself? Uh, I guess when I was a teenager. Yeah. Um, and your parents were okay with that? Or were they? I well, didn't have any say in it really. You know, they, I mean, I made my own decisions, and um, I wouldn't. You know, even though I was brought up a Catholic, I wouldn't consider myself. But I don't think that because somebody else says you're something when you're right. two weeks old, that yeah. doesn't make you that thing. Yeah. So no, I wouldn't consider myself a Catholic. But um, I don't particularly have any religious beliefs at all. Uh, but having grown up in an environment uh, where, you know, my next door neighbor on one side was the parish priest and on the other side was eight nuns. Mm -hmm. And I went to a, a Catholic school. Um, I was an altar boy. So I, you know, I grew up with that. But I, I like most of my, my peers, most of my friends, had no uh, religious leanings. The, like being an altar boy, it wasn't because we were religious. It was because uh, it was something that you were supposed to do. It was just, right. you don't question it. You're seven years old, you're eight years old. You do what you're told to do, um, but it does have an impact on you. Though. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it does. I mean, <laughs> you can't go through that. 
any of that, whether you believe it Well, of course not. not, because here we are, you know, 35 years later, yeah, and yeah, I, exactly. I, you know, I'm discussing but it, so... The Catholic friends I have, who talk about the, the power of the threat of hell, that, you know, at some point you have to decide that that's not real, because it's, 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 it's sort of pushed on you, that, yeah. that threat. And if, you're, if I were a kid, I were being told that that would be quite compelling, if, especially if everybody around me seemed to believe it. Mm -hmm. So you had to make a decision for yourself that that wasn't true either. Did that happen yeah. well before you left? I, I think any religion which bases itself on fear and, and threats and, yeah. you know, is... I don't want to live my life um, in that way. I wouldn't want my kids to live their lives in that way. You know, I think uh, that's... The church has always operated uh, with the idea of making people frightened and um, scaring them into doing what they're, they're told. And that's, that's not healthy in any way. That's, uh, and you were able to see that for yourself as a young person? Yeah, because I was being, you know, I had a terrible schooling and I witnessed and experienced um, a lot of abuse within my school by priests. And, you know, I came out the other side of that with no respect for them. I mean, why would I have respect for them? And uh, the way they treated us and the things they did to us, it was traumatic. And it made me and many other people find it very difficult to go through um, our lives, our adult lives as we started out with, very difficult to form healthy relationships, very difficult to, um, you know, be calm and measured about the world because, you know, childhood is the most important time in your life, your whole adulthood is defined by the things that happen to you in childhood and if bad things happen to you, you, um, you will struggle to move past that ever. So there was no way I was going to come out of the school that I went to with the experiences I had and feel anything but contempt for those people. But I had to set that aside as a novelist and say, right, I'm, I'm writing a story about somebody who has not done that. I have to challenge myself to find good where I have only found evil in the past. Um, I have to create a narrator who is a fully rounded human being and not just a uh, a stereotype or, or a caricature, because that's the job of the novelist. Okay, well look, 